Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. She has her own podcast on our channel, and she is part of our podcast community. And I'm very excited to have her back. It's Coach Shauna Lynn Simon. And she's here today. She's going to talk about some great things because she always has good stuff to talk about. And she is going to talk about scaling your business and navigating growth and all these other things that are co-related and how to do all these things without getting burnout. out. The number one problem that we all have to, we all have to try to avoid is burnout. And because she's such a great person and she has such great advice, I'm going to let's give it over to her right now because <laughs> I want to hear this because I need to learn from you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Stacey. And I don't know about that. You're doing fantastic. I know uh, as well. We've talked about different strategies that I know that you employ to ensure that you're, that you're doing things sustainably. But I know, I think that every time I talk about this topic, so many people are constantly like, that just sounds like an, it sounds like an oxymoron. Like there's no way you can grow in a way that doesn't cause all this chaos that doesn't require working 70 plus hours per week that doesn't require you know dedicating all of yourself into your business and mm -hmm. it's just not true and i think that uh, we are actually starting to learn more and more that there are ways to grow our business on our own terms yeah. um and i think that's like that's actually let's start there uh, i think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that most business owners face and especially i've talked previously about how I tend to work with what I call the accidental CEOs. Yeah. And so just to recap cap on that one, a, a, an accidental CEO is someone who starts a business to follow a passion, to pursue a, the goal of helping others yeah. and doesn't necessarily focus on like, oh, I'm, I'm actually going to run a business here. Yep. And so you've got the initial stuff figured out. You know what it is that you want to offer. You've got a pretty good idea how to do it. You can price your services. You got the basic stuff out of the gate. But then to scale that, that's when they start running into challenges. Yeah. And a big part of what's happened along the way, though, is they have allowed the market and other things that have come up along the way to dictate the, the direction that they're going in, Yeah. as opposed to sitting down and actually saying, okay, where do I want to take this company? What is my long-term goal? What is my long-term vision? Yeah. And I got to tell you, I work with so many female entrepreneurs that come to me, they're often, you know, just a few years into their business, sometimes they're a little bit lo longer in the business, but I usually find this happens around about year three or four, where they come to me, and they look up and they're like, I don't know how I got here. Like, I don't, I don't understand what's happening with the business. Like, yeah, they're seeing a ton of growth, but they're like, this isn't what I set out to do necessarily. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a bad thing all the time. Don't get me wrong, but you know, we kind of lose sight sometimes of what it was that we were, that initially got us fueled up and like, yeah. like what got, what got that passion stirring inside right? and you know, what got us out of bed in the morning, because it gets to the point where you're almost resentful getting yeah. out of bed. You're like, Oh, I'm just going to serve other people. And I'm going to do work crazy hours. And I'm saying yes to everything that's out there. And so the first and foremost step in order to be able to scale sustainably is you've got to have a plan. Yeah. You've got to, you got to take the time. And I don't mean you have to have everything detailed down to the last nitty gritty detail. I just mean that you need to stop for a moment and sit down and just craft out. What does your vision look like? What are you working towards? What are the goals that you want to accomplish and achieve yeah. with the mission that you're on? Right. And, and how does that align with who you are? Yeah. Because I think we lose sight of that sometimes. And, and especially, I mean, as the money's rolling in, you're like, well, the money's rolling in and you know, I just want to mm. keep money rolling in, but then you're killing yourself to make that dollar. Right. So, yeah, so I think that's probably one of the biggest things is that, um, you know, a lot of business owners find the company going in a direction that they had initially had not initially planned for. Yeah. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes these opportunities come up and you're like, you know what? I didn't have this on my roadmap, but yeah. man, this is a great opportunity. This is a great direction to take things in. So we're going to shift and we're going to pivot and we're going to head in this direction, but it still needs to be done with a little bit of thought that still needs to be done with a little bit of a little bit of planning put into it. I think that having that clarity of vision is definitely first and foremost, first step to ensuring that you're growing your business sustainably. Yeah. Oh, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I think a lot of people, they, they get scared of change, like, you know, because then in their head, they plan a certain 
specific thing they wanted to do. But sometimes, you know what, we don't realize that, you know, they might not people, the majority of people who follow you or the majority of people who are interested in your business are looking for something else. And then when you start to see the signals, I say, don't avoid it, you know, because yes. maybe that's where the business lies, you know, like be open, be open to change, you know, because, you know, sometimes like you, you think, okay, I'm open this business for X, Y, and Z. And then all of a sudden there's like a shift. And yeah. you see like the, the business is really make going to make money in this area and not so much this area. Well, right. You know, I, then you don't have to really, I think, be open and, and not be scared of that change. What do you oh, think? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I could not agree with that more. I think that, yeah, you've got it, but you, again, you've got to be able to evaluate those opportunities and ask yourself, does it align with my overall vision? Yes. You know, overall, what I set out to do, you know, I often see people fall into the mistake of, well, somebody told me that I should do this. So I decided to do that. And then somebody else told me that I should do this. And so I decided to do that. Well, yeah. those are one-off situations. I have also heard, and this is like, there are a lot of fantastic business coaches out there. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic community. I know so many incredibly talented business coaches. And at the same time, not everyone has a different method to things, Yeah. But not all coaches are created equal. Right. Right. And so there are times where I've, I've worked with someone where they're like, well, my last business coach told me I needed to do this. And here's the thing. I will tell you this, that you put six business coaches in the room and there's a good chance that they're going to have six different ideas as to the oh, direction that sure. you can take things in. Don't get me wrong. Here's the thing. At no point should your business coach ever direct your business. Exactly. Unless they're on your board of directors, <laughs> they do not actually get a say. Right. The, the role of a business coach is yeah. to guide you, right. it's to help you to explore the possibilities that exist and help you to make the decisions that you need to make. And they're hard decisions to make. And so, yeah, it's great to have that accountability, that support and that person who can help to guide you. But ultimately, it is your decision. Right. So uh, going back to what you were saying about, you know, not necessarily understanding what what in the marketplace, like what is it that they're trying to solve or not realizing what problem they can solve. I recommend doing some market research, especially if you're a few years into the business. You can do this when you're when you're first starting out before you've even launched anything, but you're even better equipped to do it once you've had a couple of years in the business, running things, and you see what's happening. Yeah. Now, now what I would encourage you to do is get together with some of your clients and some of your non-clients. So right. Gather up, like say half a dozen people who you've worked with, whether they've bought a product off of you or they've they've enlisted your services in some way. And then gather about another half a dozen people or so who haven't worked with you, who right. were on your radar as a prospect, as a lead or whatever, but they did not purchase from you yeah. and interview them, ask them about, you know, what it is that they're looking for? What problem are, are they trying to solve? How might yeah. you be able to help? You would be amazed what comes out of these conversations. And it doesn't mean that every single problem that they say like, oh, I need this solved, that yeah. you need to be the one to solve it. But let's take a look at, I think I talked about this on a previous episode because it's my favorite analogy of things, you know, when it comes to fulfilling the market's needs. Yeah. Let's take a look at Uber for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uber, they invented ride share. And when they first came out, taxi drivers were all up in arms saying like, oh, but they're not insured. And there's all these flaws to their business plan and yada, yada, yada. And don't get me wrong. I have a whole lot of respect for, for taxi drivers. We, you know, it was a great industry for a ton of years, Yeah, but e everyone had the same complaints. They didn't know when their taxi was going to show up. They didn't want to flag down a taxi necessarily. They wanted to know when their taxi was actually going to arrive without yes. waiting on the curb, without worrying that somebody else was going to take their taxi for them. Right. So they wanted that. They wanted to know what their ride was going to cost them. Yes. And they wanted a convenient way to get one. Yes. Well, in walks Uber and they solve all these problems. So, oh, yeah. you know, say what you will about how they entered the marketplace. And it was, it was a little rocky for them. And yeah. they're still, I'm not saying that they have the best business model. There's still a lot of things to work out. I'm sure behind the scenes, right. as we know, as they've grown, mm -hmm. but I got to tell you, like, I was talking to my Uber driver the other day and he was saying that he was working a full-time job and doing Uber. And he's like, I'm making more money doing the Uber. And it gives me more flexibility. He's like, I got to pick up my kids in an hour. I simply turn myself off. And if I need to pick up an extra few bucks tonight, turn myself back on. Right. So, I mean, again, I'm not saying that's the perfect system, but they solved a lot of challenges, both yeah. for the employees mm -hmm. and for the riders. So yeah. 
You know, it's, um, and I mean, look at what, look at what they've become since then. Exactly. So this is a great example of a company who took a look at the marketplace, saw an industry where there were problems and set out to solve them. I see all too often, my clients will say to me like, oh, well, they said that this was a problem, but there's no way I can solve that. There's no way we can do that. Yeah, I got to tell you in my own industries, I have seen so many times where people are like, we can't do that. Give it a few years. And guess what? We're doing exactly what we said we couldn't do a few years ago. Exactly. So who's to say you can't be the person leading that charge? Right. So having these market research calls really helps you to identify what the market really needs and can help you to craft your vision. But it doesn't mean that you have to say, well, just because this one person wants this one thing that I need to go in that direction. The problem is that as we're building our business, we're easily influenced by that. And yeah. that can cause us to get a, to veer off course until one day we look up and we don't recognize the business that we built. Exactly. And I think sometimes too, I see clients that they, they want, they really are passionate about a certain industry, but then they, they pick an industry or they pick services within that industry that has so much competition. So right. then they're just fighting, like they're a pee on the pod and they, they and they, but there's nothing they're doing that is unique or standing out, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah, like there's, there's a lot of oversaturated businesses, but there's still a, an, an incredible number of businesses that are able to stand out within that market. Yeah. So yeah, but you can't just like, oh, like, I mean, I'll, I'll give a great example. I, I have an interior design business myself. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of interior designers as clients and I got to admit, like we're a dime a dozen. If you're right. not doing something in interior design to stand out, you don't have a hope and a prayer of really exactly. building a strong business, you know? So, um, and it's not an easy thing to do. You've got to really figure out like, what is it that your clients are coming to you for that yeah. they can't get from anybody else? Right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. No, it's, um, I think that one of the great things too, about having that clarity on your vision, on who you are, what your brand is, what you offer uh, another great uh, value to that, though, kind of goes back to this. How do we do this sustainably? How do we do this okay. without getting stressed out and overwhelmed and overworked? Well, here's the beautiful thing about that. It's a lot easier when you have that that whole picture in your head, that yeah. that that image of what it is that you're building. It's so much easier to say no to the mm -hmm. things that don't fit on that path. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges for all of us, especially us women, and I know we talked about this, I think the very first episode we talked about yeah. this, about how women don't say no to things. We have a tendency to just say yes to everything. And actually, I think we talked about it briefly on the last episode as well. We it's like, yeah, it's a why big problem. Another, it's a big problem. But when you have that clarity of where you're going, it's so much easier to say, no, this doesn't fit with me. So now the only challenge that you have to overcome is just getting comfortable with how you're saying no. Because exactly. I don't think anyone ever wants to hear, no, I'm too busy. Yeah. That that, that never sounds great. Right. Word of advice, don't use that. It doesn't land well. <laughs> I'll admit, <laughs> I use it sometimes with my staff and I feel terrible every single time I use it. Uh, so, you know, I, I got some work to do on that myself. But, hmm. uh, you know, so you don't want to say, no, I'm too busy. You don't want to say, no, that just doesn't make sense for me. Like, you yeah. don't want to say it like that. But there, there, you can definitely say to them, you know, listen, I, I did a great thing. I, I really got some clarity on where it is that I'm taking this business. And in order to achieve my goals, I've had to get really disciplined about what it is I say yes to. Yes. At this time, this is always the key, at this time, mm -hmm. I do not think that I can proceed with this. I do not think I can say yes to this. I do not feel comfortable saying yes to this. Yes. that That is the key to it. I, I always leave it open. I would love to revisit this. If you're doing the same thing next year, for example, please right. feel free to reach out to me at this time. It doesn't make sense. It might in the future. You're not saying no forever. You're saying not at this time. Right. And that really helps to identify people that I know exactly where I'm going. I know what I'm doing and mm -hmm. I'm not going to let you take me off course doing it. And exactly. I'm not going to feel bad saying no about it either. No. And I think people have to learn that. And I think we've gone over it so many times because people struggle so much with it, you know, because yeah. it's like, you know, people get a little bit insecure about saying no, you know, for so whatever reason, they are afraid to say the word no, and it yeah. shouldn't be. And they end. Absolutely. And, and we talked about this on the last episode, but if you really don't want to say no, you can look at what I like to call yes opportunities of how do you say no to yeah. this, but say yes to something else that is a little less cumbersome, that doesn't impose on your time and your availability as much or on your resources as much. So if that's if that makes it more comfortable, instead of saying no, you're yeah. saying I can offer you this. 
But right. again, we just got to get more comfortable saying no. And, and here's the other thing too, is that when you say yes to things that you know, you shouldn't have said yes to yes. watch how they play out, learn from that. Yeah. Right. Like that's always a great lesson too. And I'm still guilty of it. I don't know about you, Stacey, but I'm still guilty of saying yes to too many things, even knowing yeah. all of this, like mm-hmm. I'm not perfect. Of course, I'm going to say yes to some things where, and afterwards I'm like, ah, oh, why did I do the, that? Yeah. That wasn't the best use of my time. Mm-hmm. it's a lesson learned. And, yeah. um, you know, and I felt, I felt good that I supported someone in some way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've gotten both personally and professionally, I've gotten really disciplined about what it is that I say yes to and, and what I say no to, and, and just gotten more comfortable saying no. And the, here's the other thing with saying no, you don't always have to give an explanation. Yeah. <laughs> People feel like they need to give an explanation, but they don't, they really no. don't. no. I mean, like, yeah, you can give a little bit of background, but you don't have to get that detail. Just, you know, you know, yeah. thank you so much for thinking of me. I, I'm going to say no at this time, but I really appreciate the offer. Yeah. I remember in the beginning of my business, like I felt really guilty and I was talking to another woman actually, and you know, I, it wasn't right for me at the time. And, um, and then, uh, so I was telling her about the story, you know, and she's like, I want you to remember because she was very, she was very, she, she was, she excelled and she was very high up in her business. She was doing really well. You never have to explain yourself. She said to me, she goes, she goes, you're worth every penny. And if you feel something is not right, you could say no. And you don't have to explain yourself. You should never have to explain yourself. Just yes. like you're saying right now. Yeah, Absolutely. They, there's no reason why anyone needs, I think, again, as women, especially, we feel that we need to make excuses for everything. And don't get me wrong, people appreciate understanding the why of things, mm-hmm. especially, uh, you know, some people just need full picture on things. So yeah. if you don't give it to them, they might tend to make some assumptions and speculate in their head as to the reasons for it. So if you yeah. want to control the narrative a little bit more on it, right. you are certainly welcome to explain however much you're comfortable with, but yeah. it's not necessary by any means. And I don't, I don't ever want anyone to feel as though they have to divulge so much, but like, don't get me wrong. There's times where if I've got to say no to something, um, maybe because I'm helping my parents that day. Right. I might, I might play that card. Like, I don't mean yeah. to play that card, but like, you know, I, I, sometimes I want people to know that, yeah, my time is limited because I have commitments to my parents. Uh, right. You know, I think we've mentioned previously, my dad's disabled requires full-time mm-hmm. care. And yeah. so I'm his secondary caregiver, my mom's primary caregiver. And I'm, yeah. I, I'm there quite often throughout the week and helping out. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't feel bad saying that, but I'm also not necessarily explaining to people right. the, severity of my dad's illness. And, mm-hmm. you know, like my dad has no mobility. He literally can't do anything for himself. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm not necessarily saying that I'm just, I'm usually just telling people oh, I'm helping out with my dad that day. Right. Very polite way of saying like, I'm tied up. I've got a family commitment. They don't yeah. necessarily need to know that. Like, there's no way of trying to balance the two it just exactly. doesn't work, you know? So yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, when you were talking about scaling, I thought to myself, you know, one of the biggest problems I see with scaling, especially with females, is that a lot of women are, are, don't think they're worth what they're actually providing. And I feel like also a lot of women are afraid to ask for the amount of the service. So one, they have a problem (laughs) where they're under, under, you know, they're, they're getting paid less what they deserve because mm-hmm. they're not asking for it, but then they're a little bit insecure about asking for it, even though they deserve, well deserve that price that they should be asking for. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up because the, one of the parts of the, here's what leads to burnout, working too hard because you need to make certain, a certain amount of money. Right. But if you have to work five jobs to make the amount of money that you need to make, well, what if you could work three jobs? Yeah and make the same amount of money, right? Right? Are you, are you worth that? Now? I always tell people when it comes to raising your prices, I'm a huge advocate of raising prices. I, I actually have spoken all over North America about raising your prices. Yeah. Uh, it is something that I will get up onto my soapbox and just, you know, yell until people listen, Yeah. but you can't just decide one day I'm going to raise my prices unless you know that you are actually worth it. So going back right. to what you were saying, like, yeah, you are probably worth it. Trust mm-hmm. me. 
But I recommend just doing a little bit of an evaluation, just seeing like, what are all the things that you're doing that add value? Do a bit of a market comparison. Yes. What are the things that you're doing that nobody else is doing? And when it's, when I'm talking about adding value, value is everything that you do. It's regardless of whether or not other people are doing it. Yeah. Everything that you do. Because here's the thing, if you're just looking at like, again, let's use interior designers as an example. Well, my interior designer who lives next door to me, they charge, let's say $150 an hour. I think I should be charging 250, but we have identical skill sets. So why should I charge 250 for mine? And she's charging 150. Well, right. here's the first thought. Maybe she's undercharging too. Yeah. So that's first and foremost. The second part of it is though, like, are you sure you have identical skill sets or is there something else that you are bringing to the table, whether it's a skill, whether it's an extra service, an extra level of the service that you're offering mm -hmm. an extra training that you received, you know, maybe yes. you've got background, like for myself, for example, I have a batch bachelor of mathematics degree. Right. I have a very analytical mind. I yeah. think that brings a different element to the table. And I'm not oh, saying that 100%. it, but it doesn't mean that someone else doesn't have an edge over me. I'm sure, I'm sure the next designer does have an edge over me in another area, but yeah. this is my area that I own. Yeah. So taking a look at what it is that you do that brings value and then take a look at all the, all the different training you do. Every hour you spend on a webinar, every hour you spend listening to a podcast like this, that is all an investment of your time mm -hmm. into bettering yourself. That should be put onto the client. That's your client's responsibility to pay you. So yeah, take a look at raising your prices exactly. because that will help you to avoid burning out by, by charging your worth. Yes. It's not necessarily always about getting more clients so much as just ensuring that you got the right clients. And that's the yeah. other key. When you raise your prices, mm -hmm. you're more likely to get better clients. Yes. Those better clients are going to treat you better. You're not going to feel as run down as ragged. Yeah. You know? So that's going to be a big part of it. But then the other part of it, is, and I, I know we've touched on this before as well as as women, we think we need to do everything. Right. Right. Okay. Well, if you're growing, maybe it's time to hire somebody else yeah. to help you out with some stuff. Let's crunch some numbers and figure out what would it take yeah. for you to be able to offload something. And before you tell me you are the best person in your company to do all the things that you do, uh, newsflash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Safety, you and I have talked about this. Like, it is so joyous when you offload something like, man, like they're just a rock star at doing this. Why did I ever think I should be doing this? Like, yeah, exactly. It's amazing what other people can bring to the value of your business when you when you offload certain tasks. So yeah. there might be things that, yeah, you're better at than anybody else. Absolutely true. Um, all the more reason though to identify where is your highest value yeah. to the business, to the company, and then lean into that. I mean, I know for myself, for example, I've had to take on some tasks more recently um, that I'm good at. I'm actually yeah. quite good at, but it doesn't, but somebody else could do just as good of a job. So it doesn't exactly. matter that I'm really good at these things. Yeah. Somebody else could do just as good of a job. I'm working on uh, offloading it. Don't get me wrong uh, because my highest value is of being the face of the company yeah, and doing the interviews like this and creating the content and working with my clients. That's where my highest value is. Right. My value is not on posting on social media. Exactly. That's probably not where I should be spending my time. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I do enjoy managing an ad social media to a, an extent, yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't necessarily need to create all the reels that go up there. I don't need exactly. to create every single post that goes up there. I yeah. can certainly curate it to an extent and I can yeah. oversee it, but I don't necessarily need to be doing all of it. Right. And if someone can nail down my brand and voice and just do it all for me, yeah. why wouldn't I do that? And I've met right. so many people that are like, oh, they can't do a better job than than I could, you know? And it's like, you know, I'll, I'll be one to admit, I'm very good when it comes to art. But then like when I hired someone to do my artwork, I'm like, how did they do that? You know, I was <laughs> yeah. like, you know, I'm like, they, you know, and, and then I was like, even I was trying to do something this weekend. I was like, you know what? I'm going to wait till Monday and ask someone so to do it for me. And then when, when I did, I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, people sometimes think, oh, nobody could do it better than I can. And I've heard that so many times from people. Oh yeah. But you know what? There are a lot of people that could be, do things better than we can, you know, because everyone has strengths in different areas and they have to realize that. Yeah. And you know what, going back to what we were talking about earlier about the vision of your company. So get that nailed down as well as you can keep it in mind that vision is intended to evolve and change, of course, as a business grows, yeah. but get that nailed down as well as you can and document it and then spend the time to really identify exactly how that translates into your brand. So yes. 
understanding your brand is not just about knowing your logo, your colors, your fonts, like all of that, yes, is important, but you also need to understand what is your voice? What are the things that you will say and that you won't say? Right. How do you want things represented? And put that all into a document for your branding guidelines of how yeah. to use your logo, how not to use your logo. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time, but let me tell you, when you start outsourcing, anybody can do anything for your yes. brand if they've got the right information to go from. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I, I think that's the best way if you want to grow, especially if you want to grow quickly, yeah. you know, you have to start really thinking about, okay, what are my responsibilities? You know, who could, you know, who could be doing this? Who could be doing that? But I don't know, like if you ever come across this, but many people have said, oh, I don't have the money, you know, but then if you don't, you know, you have to sometimes do the old fashioned saying, if you don't spend the money, you're not going to make the money. Right. You know? What is it that you get freed up to be able to do if somebody else can take this task off your plate? How can you generate more revenue or how can you service more clients? Like, what does that look like if someone else is, is doing this for you? So I, to me, hanging on to doing a task should be less about the money. And don't get me wrong. Pay attention to your numbers. Money is important. Absolutely. Right. But your decision for hanging on to a task should be less about the money and more about the reason why you're doing that task. So we talked about this earlier, for example, I'm doing a lot of the work for my own podcast in terms of the post-production stuff, the marketing mm -hmm. of it, not because I think I can do a better job than someone else. Frankly, I know somebody else can do a better job than I can, but it's because I don't know what I don't know. Right. And so I want to ensure that I understand every yes. part of the process so mm -hmm. that I am dictating what the brand is going to essentially represent and how that's going to translate and how we're going to communicate all of that. Yes. Once I have that nailed down, it's easy for me to pass it off to someone else. So of course, right. as, as I'm going, I am creating processes, documenting those processes so that yes. when it comes to someone else taking them over, yeah. it's so easy to pass off. So right. that's the thing that I would say, if you are working on any tasks, especially any tasks that you are not great at, yes. document them because it's going to help you in a couple of ways. One, if you're not that great at it, you could probably use a cheat sheet the next time you go to do that same task. Exactly. And two, that should be the first thing that you are offloading because I guarantee it is sucking up your time. You're probably spending three hours doing something that would take someone else 30 minutes to complete. Exactly. Right. So those are the first things that should get off your plate and free you up to bring your highest value to your yeah. company. Yeah. And, and in I, the I, meantime, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. In the meantime, say in, in the meantime, add some automation where you can, like, you know, like if you can't really can't hire someone, where can you automate things? Yeah. Yes. Sometimes automate automating things can lower the quality of certain personal type of interactions and whatnot. But honestly, it's, it's better than the alternative of not doing the thing. Right. right. So sometimes adding some automation in temporarily is not necessarily a bad idea. Yeah. You know, yes. Use a little bit of AI, be careful using AI, but use a little bit of AI, use a little bit of autom automation, standardize things where you can, you know, like even just, um, I mean, you know, for your podcast, you, probably send out reminders and such to your guests. Are you actually manually sending those out? Of course not. Right. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so having those things pre queued up, is it a little less personal? Sure. It doesn't make it any less valuable. Exactly. Exactly. You know? mm -hmm. What were you going to say? Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Oh, no, no, no. I think I, I even forgot what I was going to say. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's good though, because, you know, you really, I, you, you do have to like outsource things to other people and you're able, you know, to, to do better. And I think this was what I was going to say is that once I started to have other people doing certain tasks, I was able to do so much more, you know, mm -hmm. I was able to do focus on the things that actually brought more income in, and they were taking care of the tasks that needed to get done. But, you know, I was able to focus on things that, I, that were most important where I would right. never have the time to do that before. Beforehand. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, and that's definitely key. So taking some time to, again, evaluate where's your highest value and what are the things that if you were to hire someone else, what are the things that you can be doing with that extra time? Um, you know, even just taking a look at the amount of time you're spending on things each week. I mean, you and I were talking earlier before we got on here about uh, certain tasks and, you know, I was like, oh yeah, that takes me a couple of hours. And I'm thinking like, how is that taking a couple of hours? And I broke it down. Like, yeah, no, that takes me a couple of hours to do that. Imagine mm. what it'd be like if I just didn't have to spend those two hours every single week on that one little thing. Exactly. Even like I, 
uh, we reduced my my staff uh, pretty significantly last year when I closed down one of the divisions of my company. So uh, when that happened, I've only got three employees besides myself now um, mm-hmm. that are actually like on payroll, not outsourced, yeah. but actually on payroll. Yeah. So I had a girl who was doing the payroll for me, but it really didn't make sense for her to spend an hour to two hours every other week to do payroll. Yeah. So I took it back myself. It's still an hour to two hours every other week that I'm spending doing payroll. So it, I'm looking to outsource it to someone internally. It just didn't make sense to have an external person doing it anymore. Yeah. You know, but I'm still looking at it like, yeah, it's not a lot of time, but I could use that time in a better way. I'm sure, yeah. you know, oh, so, sure. you know, it's it sometimes, I, I, I guess what I'm saying here is that, um, you know, it's easy for us to look at something and say like, well, it's not that big of a deal. It's only an hour or two every other week. Sure. But those things add up, right? How many of those tasks do you have on your to-do list? So -hmm. start putting down, here's what I would suggest. If you're thinking about hiring, start documenting all the tasks that you are terrible at. Yeah. All the tasks you would prefer not to be doing and any of the tasks that are just a massive time suck. Now I'm oversimplifying things. There's, there's a much bigger task uh, at hand to be able to like really identify what needs to be offloaded, but put all those tasks together in a list. And try to see, are there some that can be grouped together? Maybe it's a matter of bringing in a VA for four or five hours a week with some of those things. You know, it doesn't always have to be that, well, I need to give one person 20 hours a week. Right. There's a lot of other opportunities to help you to free up time, especially as you're building up the cash, the cash flow for it. Um, You know, but you might actually start looking at these things and saying, you know what, this is actually one person. One person could definitely do this. I've got easily a part-time job here for someone and start seeking that person that can take it over. Yeah, no, I and, agree. And of course, a much bigger topic, but then you got to learn how to delegate things properly too, so that yes. they're actually off your plate. That is also key. If you've got the whole boomerang effect going on where it's like, oh, you do these parts and I'll do these parts and then everything comes back to me and I'll finalize everything. That's not delegation, but yeah. that's a whole other conversation. And I'll admit it's even a, a hard lesson that I learned not that long ago, just a few years ago, I would say that I, mm-hmm. I finally got this aha moment and uh, actually... Um, Mike Michalowicz wrote the book Clockwork and he talks about delegation. I think we might've talked about this previously, but uh, he he's mastered the art of delegation. And he was the one who was like, if you are having things come back to you to review, you're doing it wrong. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. And like, there were certain things that I was great at. I was like, oh no, I'm not doing that for everything. But there were a lot of things where I was like, why does this keep coming back to me? And the key is if you're not giving the person who's taking care of the task, all the tools they need to complete it. If you're yes. holding anything back yourself, they're never going to be able to complete it properly. It does have to come back to you. So it's a matter of giving them what they need to be successful. So I used wow. to work in hospitality for a number of years, all through university, all through my first career, all through building this business, about 15 years in hospitality. And in in the restaurant industry, there are different shifts of employees and especially front of house staff where you're going to have someone who's going to work maybe the breakfast and lunch shift. The next person's yeah. going to come in, in the afternoon, work the dinner shift. Maybe they're working into the evening and whatnot. Every time an employee is finishing up their shift, there is a list of tasks that they need to complete in order for the next person to be able to take over their shift. So every time you're closing something down, you've got to make sure all these things are cleared off. And the, the terminology that we always used in the hospitality industry was to set the next person up for success. Right. So did you set your next teammate up for success? I got to tell you, I've been guilty of this myself where I'm assigning a task to someone and I'm like, I didn't set them up for success. Right. I didn't give them everything they needed to be successful. So ask yourself the next time you delegate something out to someone, did you give them everything that they need to be successful? Because if you're saying I can't delegate, I can't ask anybody else to do things because they do a terrible job at it. Yeah. Let's check where the problem is. Right. Exactly. Because I can say like, even to this day, if, if a task comes back, not the way that I was expecting it or intending it, first thing I'm going to do is go back to the instructions that I gave and evaluate, like, did I give the right instructions in the first place? And I will tell you nine times out of 10, it's on me. It's, yeah. not, on the, uh, it's not on the person that attempted the task. Sometimes it is, they haven't read the instructions properly, or maybe they misunderstood something and didn't ask clarifying questions as they should have, you yeah. know, like, yes, it's not always me, but Anytime, and I will say it's very rare though, that tasks I assign don't get done properly. Right. But when they don't, you know, it's usually, I can usually look back on it and say like, oh, it's probably, it was how I explained things. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. oh, I agree with you totally, you know, and it took me a while when I first started to delegate things to other people, I wasn't used to it. Like, you know, and when right. you're used to it, it's kind of awkward in the beginning, you know, and, yeah. but then there is a method, like you said, and you have to go like what, use that method, you know, in order to, you really have to set them up for success because if they, if, if they don't have access to everything that you have access to, then how can they get the job done without giving it back to you to just double check or add this or whatever? Yeah. And it gets to the point where you shouldn't be checking things and things are just happening behind the scenes and you yeah. don't even, you haven't even touched it. I right. mean, it happens in my, like, I will tell you, I, it's always amazing to me when someone is surprised to know that I didn't know something happened in my company and don't get me wrong, big stuff. Yeah. Of course I'm involved in right. little stuff. No. Yeah. If someone will say to me like, Oh yeah, I was talking with your, your admin earlier today. Did she tell you I'm like, no, was there an action item for me? If not, yeah. I don't know about it. Right. Until it becomes, so if, if someone wants to book me on a podcast, for example, if someone wants to hire me for a speaking event, uh, you know, whatever it is, they'll often think that I know about it before I actually know about it. No, there are certain ones where she will say, I need your evaluation on this. She assigns me a task to evaluate. It gives me all the details that I need for it. But until it gets to that point, I don't necessarily know that she's even having the conversation because right. she knows what she's doing. Yeah. I don't need to be a part of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I just need to go out there and speak. She's the one who she's handling all the booking stuff. She's handling like, you know, people say to me, oh, did you get the Zoom link? I don't know. Yeah. That's my assistant. Like she, she knows all these things. She's a rock star at this stuff. So yeah. no, I don't, I don't need to be paying attention to whether or not every little nitty gritty detail is getting done. There are times where some things are coming directly to me and now I've got to loop her and like, Hey, this came to me instead of you. Yeah. And we're trying to get people trained now that like, don't send it to me. Yeah. Because then it just gets lost in my email somewhere, you know? So it's a beautiful thing when you get to the point where uh, just knowing that things are just taken care of without even having to touch them. It's fantastic. Oh yeah, for sure. And 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 when even having a, a an assistant like saved me hours and hours and hours oh. of work, you know, yeah. and things, you know, just going through just going through emails of people who wanted to set up appointments, you know, that that was an easy three hours, you know. It was oh, just, yeah. going through, just going through the emails and then having to respond. And, you know, it took off a quarter of the day, you know. It's yeah. like and and so then, you know, then you have to do other stuff and you have to do other stuff. It's like and if you if you're not delegating it to other people, by the time the end of the day, you're like, what did I do? And the right. question I think you have to ask yourself, did I do the right things to make my business grow? And I think that's where if you haven't, that's like what you're talking about. Then the the burnout will come in, you know. And I love what you just said there because it's something that I talk about often is you know, and what are what is it that you're using to evaluate? when something gets your attention and when it doesn't. And I look at these tasks of like, if I, if I had to take a look at my task list for the day, what am I going to focus on? What's going to be my top priority? I'm going to take a look at what's going to make me money. What's going to yeah. lead me closer to my goal, my revenue goals, my ultimate goals, whatever it looks like, what is going to take me closer to all of this? Because if it's, if it's just busy work, why am I doing that? Yeah. You know? And again, there's always going to be things, especially as you're first building your business, always going to be things that are busy work that just need to get done, whether you like it or not. Exactly. But yeah, like taking a look at, you know, what's going to make you money, what's going to bring you closer to your goal. Absolutely. That's exactly how you should be evaluating those things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love how you, you mentioned all three things you talk about, you know, um, you know, the first thing was navigating growth and then you talked about scaling and then you talked about burnout, you know, and then it's like, all these things are interconnected with each other, you know, they are, and, they are. And, and especially when it comes to scaling, because if you're under underestimating yourself and you're not, you're working, you know, four times as high, you know, hard to get to this, to this low amount and at the end of the week, you're like, I did all this work and how did I only come up with X amount of dollars for the week? You know? Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and what else could you have been doing with that time? Could you have been spending it with your family and loved ones? And, you know, could you have been just enjoying a spa day to yourself? Could you have been, you know, just going on an extra long hike one day? Like what could you have done with the time that you spent running around making next to nothing? Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And there's definitely, don't get me wrong, there's a, there's there's some work that needs to go into raising your prices, getting paid your worth. Like there's, you know, and I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, if you're listening to this, you're thinking like, I, this, this is speaking to me, like, yes, I need to know more about this. I'm happy to set up a call with you. Go to aboutshawnalyn.com forward slash coach me. It's a free call. Always happy to have a chat, uh, you know, but it's, it's something that I think that 
we all need to be paying closer attention to what is it that we're getting? What like every, everything costs more than what we think it should cost. Yeah. Except when it comes to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. And we end up paying the ultimate price in the end. And that is by sacrificing our health and our wellness. You know, I, uh, we, we've talked about health and wellness a few times and I've, I've told my story of, of burning out and, yeah. you know, I gained 20 pounds, uh, because I wasn't allowed to work out for three years and I've mm-hmm. lost since then I've lost 30 pounds. So I lost the right. 20, I gained an additional 10 pounds, apparently that I didn't know that I had to lose, but I shouldn't say I had to lose, but like it was available to lose is what I meant yes. to say. Uh, it was available to lose. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I, I wasn't going based on weight. I was going based on on health and and where do I feel healthiest? Yeah. And I got to tell you, like when, you know, I, I've I've turned activity into such a big part of my daily routine that it's hard for me when someone says, "Well, I don't have the time for it." I got, I lead a busy life, and I still prioritize. I'm getting my workout in. You know, it's yeah, yeah. It's at six o'clock in the morning. Great time for a workout. I got to tell you, mm-hmm. I've recruited a lot of people into my five a.m. club. We get our workouts in at six a.m. And it's yeah. funny, like just before I got on this call, one of my running partners messaged me like, Hey, you want to go for a run tomorrow morning at six? Yeah, I'll be there. You know? So yeah. I've recruited a lot of people that are, are along the same lines, uh, but you know, there's ways to get more out of each and every day. Yes. I think that's definitely the key. I mentioned this on the last podcast. I've got a fantastic download that has my top five time management tips for the busy entrepreneur to help yeah. you to avoid burning out. Just go to about forward slash time to download it. Um, you know, there's some fantastic resources, uh, there as well. Uh, but honestly it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hours to be gained every week. Mm-hmm. I still manage to fill a lot of them. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah. I do enjoy working. I love what I do and I don't have a problem working some late hours at times, Yeah, but I will not ever work 16 hours straight. Right. If I am working at eight o'clock at night, it's because I took some good breaks throughout the day to break yes. up that time. And I've chosen to work at eight o'clock at night. It is very, very rare where I am looking at the clock resenting that I'm working at a particular time. And yeah. it's not like I, it's, I don't do this every night. Don't get me wrong. I don't do this every night. But what I'm saying is like, you're allowed to work some late hours sometimes, it, mm-hmm. you know, this, it's all part of building your business, Yeah, but it's gotta be on your terms. You know, yes. you get to dictate that and I can promise you that the more care you put into your own health and wellness, the better your business will do. Yes, I agree. hundred percent. Cause I was a victim of that myself. And once I started taking care of myself and started really focusing on me first, that little self care, you know, mm-hmm. everything else started to pull in place. Yeah. I mean, even you boost your immune system. Yeah. If you're someone who gets sick every few months, imagine what boosting your immune system would do, but you know, that right. when you're sick, you're not as productive, of course. Yeah. So think about the time that you can gain from that. Not to mention if you get sick and then you get everyone else in your house sick now, what's going on? Like, so not only did you, were you out down for the count for a few days yourself, but yeah. now you're taking care of other people in your house because they're sick. So how many hours are you losing that yeah. you could be spending doing better things than that? So again, as some, adding some activity and, and paying attention to what is that you're eating. And it's not to say that you, you know, <laughs> I often laugh, you know, people are often saying like, do you just eat salads all day? <laughs> or, or I get the opposite of it where they're like, you must be able to eat whatever you want. Cause you're so fit. And here's the thing. It's a little bit of both. I do yeah. enjoy a good salad. Don't get me wrong. I do very much enjoy healthy food, Yeah, uh, but my healthy food has a ton of flavor to it. And because I live such a healthy lifestyle, I have zero guilt indulging when I want right. to indulge. Right. It's, you know, it's all about moderation. It's all about balance, but yeah. I, I enjoy a very healthy lifestyle, but I, I have fun. Like it's not, it's not restricting. I don't, yeah. I, I've never in my life been on a diet, mm-hmm. but there, I have learned that there are certain foods that don't react as well to my body in terms of my energy levels. And so I yeah. avoid those things, you know, that is a, a discipline that I'm willing to have for, because of the value I get out of it. It's, 100%. I don't feel restricted. I feel empowered by it. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then, you know, what a lot of people tend to like certain foods and then they, they eat it and then they feel like they want to fall asleep. And that's like, you know, that's your body telling you, Hey, you know, I got to work really hard to digest this. Please don't eat it. Yes. You know? (laughs) Yes. And it's so, I love that you said that too, because, you know, we're often not making that connection of like, Oh, why do I feel so sluggish? Yeah. Your body's like, listen, this is really hard for me. I get that you enjoyed it. 
but just understand that, you know, I'm going to work really, really hard here. And, uh, you know, and keep it in mind too, that the, the foods are different for everyone. So I could tell people what it is that I eat and what I don't eat. Right. You know, I'm constantly being asked about that. Well, what did you do? What did you do to lose the weight? How, what exercises do you do? What, what foods do you eat? And everybody's body types are made up differently, but yeah. I can say there's some pretty consistent things that, um, you know, if you are finding that you're a little bit sluggish, take a look at things like your caffeine intake, your, mm -hmm. uh, saturated fats. Those yeah. are huge. Um, your white breads, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and even just gluten in general, yeah. I know that a lot of people are like, Oh, this whole gluten-free thing, there is actually validity to too much gluten in some people's diets can cause them to be more sluggish. Yeah. It's not going to affect everyone the same way though. You might not be someone who's as affected by it, but, uh, white, wheats especially are converted into sugars yeah. um, when you're, when you're processing them and those sugars can cause your body to, you know, it, it changes your insulin levels yeah. and, and your glucose levels, and it can cause your body to spike and crash yeah. all in a matter of an hour, basically. So that disruption to your body is really difficult to take, which causes that sluggishness. So yeah. again, you know, f just paying attention to what you're eating, how you're feeling afterwards, and you can kind of dictate your own, your own navigation plan for, for what is it that works best for your diet. 100%. But again, I use the word diet more in terms of like, what are your eating habits? Yeah. Not so much like don't get onto any of the fad diets. There's not a single fad diet out there that mm -hmm. is sustainable. Exactly. A hundred percent. So true. So true. You need a lifestyle adjustment, not a yes. massive change necessarily, just an adjustment that yeah. you know allows you to have that balance. And exactly. if you want to eat some of those foods, because trust me, I get it. They're delicious. So <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I, I'm imagining some of them right now, but um, you know, introduce a few healthier options and you'll be amazed at how much better you're going to feel. It's all about balance. Yeah. yeah it's all about balance. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and also take some vitamins too. Even if you, if there's, especially if there's no green things on your plate, if there's no green things on your plate. You're going to need some vitamins somewhere. Oh, a hundred percent. And as you get older too, your, our deficiencies, like we become deficient oh, yeah. in a lot of things, you know, and we have to replenish ourselves because we talk about productivity and we're talking about business, but you can't have productivity when you're, when you're sluggish and you're dragging your feet and you can't think straight and your, you know, your clarity isn't good. That all goes about how you're taking care of your body. So, oh, absolutely. And I mean, I know you live in a climate that experiences all four seasons. Yeah. If you are someone who lives somewhere where you experience all four seasons, even just your lack of access to the sun can affect us, you know, like I, so I live in Canada. Yeah. Uh, Canada, because we do get a, a long winters, we get a lot of extra yeah. cloud cover, our, our nights are longer, we see less sun. So we have a natural in Canada, we naturally have a vitamin D deficiency. Yeah, pretty much. They've said every single Canadian should be taking vitamin D supplements, right? Um, I'm not a doctor or anything. Don't get me wrong, go see your dietitian, go see your naturopath, go see your doctor, whatever. Uh, but the reality is so that yeah, there's just there's a natural deficiency there. And never mind, yeah. as you're aging, your body is just unable to produce things or to store things and, and take the nutrients out of the, the foods you're putting in yourself as, as well as it used to be able to. So you might need to supplement things like iron, zinc, B12. There's, you know, tons of different supplements out there. Yeah. Um, but again, I could give you a list of vitamins. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what your body is lacking in. So there's exactly. tests that can tell you, go get a yeah. test. Go I get promise. a blood test. Yes. hundred yeah, percent. <laughs> It's fantastic what it can tell you. Yeah. You know, and especially if you're women of a certain age, like we are, you know, yeah. There's something to be said for that, that, yeah, yeah, the body just doesn't, uh, yeah, like a lot of things are changing and, and that's okay, but paying attention to it. And if you notice yourself feeling like you're always tired, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it could be a deficiency. It could also be that you are burning out. Yes. And I think that's the other thing as well, that just be aware of the signs and the symptoms. If you are finding that you're extra tired, and I mean, like, you don't want to get out of bed kind of tired. Yeah. If you're finding that you're extra irritable, if you're finding that you're experiencing physical symptoms like nausea, headaches, anxiety, uh, if you're finding that your, your blood pressure is always high, like these are things, these are all signs of burnout. And yeah. especially the older we get, the more damage, long-term damage they can actually be doing to our bodies. So uh, oh, get it checked 100%. out sooner than later, for sure. And see if there's something else active going on there. But uh, making a few lifestyle changes and reducing your work hours. Yeah. Your workload is huge for that. So you can scale and reduce your workload all at the same time. It's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Implementing the tips that we provided today, like all of that helps you to scale 
without necessarily having to work the extra hours. Scaling doesn't mean you just work more hours. Yes. That's not how it works. So. No, no, <laughs> that's so true. So true. And, you know, I remember the first time I scaled my business and, you know, I, I was under, under, I was underpricing a lot of things, not thinking, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, oh, you know, I was underestimating my self-worth, you know, in the beginning right. of my business. And then once I realized what other people were, 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 were charging in the industry and I realized all the experience and all the knowledge I had, and then I upscaled, it was, I was working less hours and I was making more money a week. And so it, it was the opposite and in it, and it helped because then I could focus on other things to make my business yeah. grow. And I was avoiding that burnout that I was getting a lot, you know, and now I know the symptoms. So as soon as right. I feel any symptom, I, I, I stop in my tracks and I'm like, I reevaluate myself. I'm okay. Yeah. What am I doing? What do I need to change? And what do I need to stop doing? Well, you know what the other value though, to, to taking a step back and allowing yourself those breaks, allowing yourself those extra hours and time, you're actually going to do a better job on your business because you will have your best ideas when you're not working. Yes, that's very true. So if you're always working, you're leaving no room for those brilliant ideas to get into your head. Yes. And so like for me, like I love going for my walks and I managed to get a few walks in the last couple of days. It's been absolutely gorgeous here. And I'll admit the last couple of weeks, weather's been terrible. So I haven't gotten my walks in yeah. despite my best efforts. And it's so funny, just in the last couple of days, I had all these brilliant ideas. I'm like, oh my gosh. How do these not come to me sooner? Yeah, it's because I didn't allow my brain to properly rest. So even I can be yeah. guilty of it sometimes, you know, but um, yeah, I know we definitely need to be able to take those breaks. Um, but yeah, and so charging more, so you're working less, you're again, you're gonna have better quality clients. I mean, I know yeah. for myself, you know, I'm a business coach. And when I first priced my coaching services, I looked at what everybody else was doing. And align myself. I think we're all guilty of doing that at some point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after evaluating things, I took a look at what it is that I provide that a lot of coaches don't provide exactly. for starters for me, an hour session, I'm spending at least 30 minutes prepping for it and 30 minutes post. Yep. So one hour session, you're getting actually two hours of my time, yes. not to mention, you're going to get me in between our calls. You're going to get a summary notes. You're going to get action items. You're going to get templates and worksheets and all these different resources. There's yes. so much more that I put mm -hmm. into things that I know other coaches aren't necessarily doing. Yeah. Some are, and the ones who are, they're charging what I'm charging. Right. Like it's, you know, so the more that I looked at, you know, what my, what my rates were, I, I think I'm actually quite reasonable for what you get. Because not only am I putting in the time, it's yeah. not just about that, of course, it's the results. Yes. You know, I see the results that my clients are getting and they're making their money back tenfold. So, you know, why am I not charging what exactly. I'm worth? Exactly. Right. 100%. So, so yeah. And I, I think it's always difficult for us to raise our prices. We're afraid we're going to uh, upset some people. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's the best advice that I can give you. If you were thinking about raising your prices, and again, I've talked all over North America about this. So I, yeah. I'm trying to condense some of my best tips to just a few moments here. But if right. you were thinking about raising your prices, I want you to listen to that voice in your head that is telling you not to, and you're hearing a client giving pushback. And now what I want you to do is put a name to that client because we all know they've got a name. They are mm -hmm. one particular client in your database that is always the squeaky wheel. Yes. And I want you to evaluate whether or not that client is worth keeping. Right. Because majority of the time, it's the biggest thorn in your side. And yeah. so if raising your prices is going to upset them to the point where they're not going to work with you anymore, is that really the worst thing that could happen? Exactly. You know, like exactly. I, I have had so many people over the years for various different businesses that I've had that will say, I love this when they're referring me you know what? She's not the cheapest, but she's the best. Yeah. That is what you want people saying about you. Mm -hmm. So this one person who's saying, oh, I left her because she was charging too much. Right. That's his opinion. Yeah. I don't think anybody else, if someone has told me like, oh, I left because I was, they were charging too much. I'm not judging that person and thinking that they're too expensive. I'm thinking yeah. this person didn't value them enough. Right. And that's fine. That's not your client. Yeah, exactly. All right. So move on from that. But um, what I would also say in terms of, I know this wasn't what we're planning on talking about today, but again, it's all about scaling and big part of scaling is raising your prices. So nothing that I will say is if you've got some of those loyal clients, 
do what all the software companies do. You know, when software companies can be raising their prices, most of them will send you a heads up email. We're going to yes. be raising our prices on July 1st. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you legacy pricing for right now. Right. Which means that they've raised the price on their platform to anybody else who signs up today, they're getting the new expensive price. You are getting grandfathered and yeah. you're getting that legacy pricing. It's going to continue for X number of days. Sometimes it's indefinitely. Sometimes it's not totally your call. Yeah. Whatever you decide to do though, make sure your clients are well aware of exactly what you've done. Exactly. So if you, if you grandfather their pricing, but they didn't know you raised the price for everybody else, they don't understand that, that they're getting special treatment. So yeah. make sure they understand a special treatment. And if there is an expiry date for it, make sure that's communicated super clear to them. Right. And the other thing that I recommend doing sometimes is if it's possible to downgrade them to meet a different price point for them, mm -hmm. consider offering them that. Yeah. So can you downsell them a little bit? So maybe the service that you've been providing that no longer works for them in terms of your new pricing. Can you pull some items out of that service to offer a similar service at a lower price point? Yeah. And not to compromise your quality or anything else, but sometimes there's a way of just taking out some of the bells and whistles yes. and just paring something down and being able to offer that to someone instead. So there's a lot of ways that you can raise your price as well, keeping that loyalty of your best clients. Yeah. Uh, you know, you do want to definitely treat them well. I always say that my cell phone provider is the most terrible at maintaining loyalty because they give all sorts of promotions to all the new people and I get nothing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So don't be your cell phone provider. Right. Be the, be a better company than that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but no, yeah. it's, yeah, I, I, I feel you. I hear you. <laughs> anyway. Oh, yeah. No, I think, um, like I said, I, you know, try to condense down into like, you know, some bite-sized tips for that. But there's a lot that goes into raising your prices, but essentially you're going to evaluate where, where's your value, where's your worth, figure yeah. out what you think you should be pricing at, ignore that voice in your head. If it sounds exactly like the most annoying client you've ever worked with, because you'll just get rid of them, yeah. uh, communicate it to your clients in, with as much notice as possible, offer them an extension of the legacy pricing for whatever duration makes the most sense for you, but raise the price immediately for everybody else, exactly. uh, you know, and then um, make sure that, that you maintain the loyalty and uh, you know, and, and continue to serve your clients with the best quality as, as well. And yeah. And then downsell them if necessary. I think that's great advice. Now, if you had to like take um, a couple of important takeaways from everything we discussed today, what would be some of the things you just want to emphasize a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to go back to clarify your vision. Just understand what, what the business is that you are building for yourself and the direction that you really want to take it in. And, you know, I'm going to actually add on to that what we talked about, about self-care and allowing yourself some space to breathe and allow your mind to think a little bit. That's what you're going to need to get that clarity of your vision. If you just decide to sit down tomorrow and I'm going to write out my vision, yeah, uh, you know, you might get a good chunk of it done, but you need to allow yourself to percolate on it a little bit. So mm -hmm. go for those walks, go for the run in the morning, go for the workout, um, you know, even just like lay down with your cat and have a little snuggle or something like whatever mm -hmm. it looks like, but allow your mind to be at rest so that you can yeah. really get that clarity. Because once you get that clarity, it's going to be so much easier for you to make the decisions that support the growth that you want and yeah. allow you to identify where your highest value is, what should be outsourced and the overall path you're going to take to grow that company in a vision that aligns with you, with you, your integrity and, and where you want to go. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Now for people who don't know you, can you tell everybody the services that you provide so they know? Yeah, of course. So I think I've kind of talked about this on the episode, of course, but I do offer both one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching services. So if you go to aboutshawnalyn.com, you can check it all out there. Uh, and I also do offer on-demand online training predominantly for home staging professionals. So if you're in that industry, I've got lots of great courses for you as well. And again, go to aboutshawnalyn.com. You'll check it all out there. Awesome. And yeah. tell them about your podcast that you're creating. Uh Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So my podcast is called the real women, real business podcast, and it is designed specifically for female entrepreneurs to help them to grow and build their businesses sustainably 
without the stress and the overwhelm that normally comes along with it. I've got some great guests that have joined me on the show that bring in their insights and strategies as well. Uh, we're talking about, you know, real life stuff, things that are really happening in our lives, in our businesses, how we're navigating them, the challenges that we're facing, the drawbacks, but also the uh, the tips and strategies for getting through things. And it's we're building a community, essentially, of women who are just supporting each other and empowering each other and uh, and helping to raise each other up on this on this journey. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, this has been amazing. I love yes. having you on the show. You always Save. have such great, great, great input, you know, and uh, I love that, you know, your, your insight is so good because you really, if you follow these, these techniques that you, 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 you mentioned throughout the podcast, they will work. And, you know, yes. I've applied them in my life and they have worked, but I think we just have to stress to people does not happen overnight. They have it to does people. not happen overnight. Yes. <laughs> but they do work. These are all proven strategies. And you yes. know what? They're not rocket science either. They're not these major, they're not um, it's not a hook. It's not, you know, a, a TikTok video with a yeah. do these two things and you'll become an instant millionaire. That's not what we're saying. It does take some time and some work, but it's actually not that hard. Yeah. At the end and of the day. And what I like is, is that having a coach like you, they can, you could guide them because it's so easy to get off track. Absolutely. And when you have someone that you could talk to on a weekly basis and maybe have some follow-up calls with, you stay on track. They keep you yes. on track and they give you baby steps so you don't get overwhelmed. And exactly. I think that's what's so important. I think everyone should have a coach. Everyone. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, I've got a new coach now, um, but I'm constantly like, you're going to love, you're going to have to level up sometimes where you go grow your coach. And yes, even my own clients have outgrown me and gone on to some phenomenal coaches, uh, you know, coaches that, that I look up to and admire. So, uh, you know, at, at some point, if you've already got a coach, that's great, wonderful. Um, but if you're ever looking to, to level up, I'd also be, be happy to have a chat. Yeah. That's awesome. This has been amazing. Thank you, Shauna. For As always. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you so appreciate it. Oh, uh, I appreciate you. You're the best. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.